Well, good morning. Glad to see so many of you were able to get across the 14th Street Bridge. And we're able to get up this morning after a very full day yesterday. Uh, I'm going to start with the most important slide for those of you who might want more information on this. Uh, my email address is up here, mnelson at pobox.com. Some of this material is based on a talk that I gave about a year and a half ago with Chris Francis at the Telecommunications Policy Research Conference, and I'll be happy to give you a pointer to that paper so that you can get some of the more details behind the headlines here on this talk. Uh, as was mentioned, I've uh, uh, been in government, so I'm going to give you uh, sort of the big picture here, talk about where the technology is going, talk about different scenarios that I think could develop with regard to virtual worlds and cloud computing, talk about specifics about what it means for the people in this room, and then finish with the depressing news, all the different challenges we're going to face going forward if we're going to make this work in Washington or anywhere else, because there are, are some very thorny policy issues we need to address. Uh, I've had a varied career, uh, started off in geology and geophysics. Uh, some people think that's kind of odd. Why is somebody who is working on internet technology coming from that background? But I can tell you in, in my 10 years in government, having a sense of geologic time was incredibly useful. <laughs> and right now, <clears throat> we're in the middle of a technological earthquake, so my work in seismology has also been useful. I, I was very lucky in my career. I had several just chance encounters that led to my dream job. And the job I'm in now, I think, is my dream job. I get to combine my background in technology, my interest in government and policy, and my interest in culture, all in one job. I'm teaching students who are coming from dozens of different countries, lots of different backgrounds, from technology to business to law to film studies to psychology to social studies, social science. And we're, and we're all trying to understand the same thing. How does technology shape society, and how is society shaping technology? And I just happened to get this job when my old friend, Linda Garcia, the head of the program, called me up and said, you must know somebody who wants this job. And I said, I think I want this job. <clears throat> Let me now share with you the most important thing I've learned in my 20 years in Washington. And this may be the only thing some of you remember from this talk, but it's the most important thing. Always have a good bumper sticker. <clears throat> I have an after dinner talk I give called 50 Things I Learned in Washington. I only give it after everybody in the room has had two glasses of wine and all the tape recorders are turned off. But the very first item is always have a good bumper sticker. Always have seven or eight words that summarize your key point, your key objective. If you don't, you, you won't succeed in Washington. There are too many busy people who need that bumper sticker. They need more detail and facts as well, but they need that summary statement. Another thing I learned is you need two or three good, memorable factoids, preferably true. These are things like nine out of 10 dentists recommend Crest. How many of you have that embedded in their brain from your childhood? How many of you are still using Crest? What I'm going to do today is give you some bumper stickers and give you some factoids about where computing is going and how this will impact virtual worlds. Another really important thing I learned in Washington, particularly from the congressional hearings I used to run, is it's helpful to state your conclusions up front. It's never clear how much of your audience will be around at the end. So here are my conclusions. <clears throat> We're entering the third phase of the internet. This is as profound as the World Wide Web and we have about two or three years to get it right. In, this, in the decisions we're making right now are going to define what this infrastructure looks like for the next 10, 5, 10, even 15 years. And they're not just policy decisions. They're not, it's not just the lawyers who are making these decisions. It's standards bodies, it's business practices, and it's users who are making some of the decisions that will shape this internet. The other point I want to leave behind, and this is a bumper sticker I hope you'll use with your colleagues and your, your management, we're less than 15% of the way through this internet transformation. And what's great about that is no matter how you measure it, 
we're less than 15% of the way through. The total number of users in the world, total amount of bandwidth, amount of content, number of applications, there's a lot more coming. Six or seven or 10 times more still coming. New changes, new technologies, new opportunities. So let me now talk about four different technology trends and quickly just touch on these, provide the context in which virtual worlds are going to grow up. Right now, the internet is an unruly teenager. And like most teenagers, it's making really important life decisions. In contrast, virtual worlds are about uh, two years old. So you're in the ter terrible two state. So let's first talk about what I consider the, the most profound change that we're undergoing right now, and that is cloud computing. Uh, I've been working for about 10 years on grid computing, which is in many ways a prototype for the cloud coming out of the academic research community. In the last two years, we've seen a lot of buzz about the huge data centers that Amazon and Google have been building to provide cloud services. Today, in the Valley, if you want to start a startup and you go to a venture capital firm, they're going to insist that you get all your computing from the Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud. That service, which just provides raw storage and computing power, is the foundation upon which more than a thousand different startups are running their websites. It's very cheap, much cheaper than buying your own systems and hiring your own people to run them, and usually more reliable. Uh, Gmail is probably the most commonly understood cloud service. It looks like regular email, but it's in the cloud. And it's the entry drug, it's the first step, getting people used to the idea of having services provided from the cloud, having their data stored, who knows where. Another interesting um, statistic is that Akamai, which is just a big storage cloud that serves content for websites all around the world, is now delivering about 15 or 20 percent of all the internet traffic that's out there. And then the last thing I point you to is Boink, the Berkeley Open Internet uh, uh, open infrastructure for network computing. And this is a site that you can go to and tie your computer into the Boink cloud, which can then provide computing cycles <clears throat> to researchers who are doing everything from cancer research to prime number factoring to environmental modeling. This is a site that Akamai runs. It shows you what's happening on their part of the cloud. And what's important here are two numbers. <clears throat> the top right corner, 2.8 million hits per second. That's how many web pages are being pulled down from their different servers scattered around the world. And the other number in the bottom right-hand corner, 3.4 million visitors per minute. So you can see this is a big piece of the internet, and yet we don't hear about it very much. But it's proof that the cloud is happening and that it is an effective way to deliver the net. More proof that the cloud has arrived is that, it, it, is that on March 26th, it was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Some of you may, may have seen this article. It's a, a useful article in that it talks about the terminology and what's really happening. Um, and, and there is a lot of hype now about cloud computing, but the one thing that comes through in this, in this this article is that this is fundamentally different. This is the third phase of the internet. It is the third phase of the computing. Of computing. Let me share with you what I call some our, our CEO pictures. These are diagrams that I use with CEOs and prime ministers to help them understand in very clear terms what's going on. <clears throat> so the first phase of computing was simply communicating, moving messages from here to there. Then phase two with the web became the broadcast phase of the internet. So initially one-to-one -one email, one-to-one -one remote login. That dominated the net for 20 years. The web came along. Now it was a broadcast medium, one-to-many. Content dominated the traffic on the net. In the last couple years, many-to-many -many collaboration has been the story. It started with peer-to-peer -peer computing, the grid, and now cloud computing. And that's going to dominate traffic for the next at least five years uh, and lead to a very large surge in the amount of traffic. 